So this will be a brief presentation on basically an overview of the finite element method. And I just want to tell you what this will be and what it won't be. So basically uh, the, what I want to do with this is sort of show a rough overview of what the finite element method is, an uh, overview of how it works, and a short example of how you would apply it to a few problems. Uh, one of those will be the Poisson equation and then, uh, and then a solid mechanics problem. But I just want to say that I'm not going to be going through all the math in detail and I'm not going to be showing the programming in detail because the, just the math itself is basically an entire presentation within itself. And so I kind of want this to just be a rough overview and then so you kind of understand the different topics involved with finite element method and then you can go later uh, if you for some reason need to go into more detail you can go start looking at these individual topics and <clears throat> the reason why I wanted to do it like that is because I remember when I first started learning about this method it I found huge details of little teeny things all over the place and I had a hard time figuring out how everything kind of fit together. So I just wanted to kind of show how everything fits together and a broad overview and then you can kind of start digging into the details later if you need to. So the finite, so this is just what I was just talking about. So I'm planning on giving an overview and then I'm going to do a MATLAB example and the MATLAB example will have both the, it will be for the Poisson equation, like solving it and then um, and then I'm going to do a solid mechanics example, and then I'm going to do an example in a solid mechanics example in Moose. And Moose is the finite element multiphysics framework that was developed by Idaho National Lab, and I'll talk more about that when I get to that topic. So, what is finite element analysis? So, FEA and FEM are basically the same thing. So, finite element analysis or finite element method. And so they're, they're, it's a numerical method that approximates solutions to differential equations that have boundary values. And it's useful because it's widely applicable to a wide range of PDEs. And so it's mathematically rigorous. It has, uh, it has proofs of accuracy, stability proofs, conver convergence proofs, and solution uniqueness. And if you, you probably won't get into all those details unless you're writing your own finite element code, but if you ever do, then, the, then, that, then these are good to dig into and know. So, and so basically it works by finding a solution function that is made up of shape or basis functions. And these are multiplied by coefficients and added together. And so this is the same idea as polynomial fitting, except the functions that you, that you use in finite element analysis are usually more complex than what's used in polynomial fitting. So in polynomial fitting, you have x to whatever power, and well, x to i, and you're figuring out what the coefficients are. And so I, I so you can use these, you can use the, um, the same, you can use the same functions in FE that you use for polynomial fitting, but in FE there it's usually more complex. So the basic steps in finite element analysis are first you, so, and this is the kind of the broad overview, so first you establish a strong form of your equation, so you have your equation and you write it in the strong form, and this is the equation. This is the form the equations are normally seen in. So you probably already have that. And then you want to obtain the weak formulation, and the weak form is also called the weighted residual or variational statement. And this is usually done by by hand on paper. And then you choose approximations for your unknown functions, and then you'll choose a basis function, and then you'll solve your equations. And I'll go. I'll show. What, I'll show an example of 
each of these steps for the Poisson equation. And so when you're solving these problems, most people are going to be using a FE solver, and so you're not actually even looking at equations or going through any of this. You're probably just defining, you're probably creating your mesh, you're defining your boundary conditions, and that might be about it, and then you're solving it. But I feel like this is useful to kind of have an understanding of the math in the background, because then if you're getting bad answers from your solver, or it's not working, like it's not converging or something like that, then you can have a better idea of things to try to fix it. So this is, I want to go through each of these steps for the Poisson equation. So remember step number one was to establish the strong formulation. And so this is the, this equation, the u double prime x is equal to f of x. That's the strong formulation, that's the strong form of the equation for the Poisson equation. And then I have some boundary conditions. So u of zero is equal to zero. So that's Dirichlet condition. And then u prime of one is equal to zero. That's a Neumann boundary condition. So this would be mixed boundary conditions because I have two different types of boundary conditions. And so the reason why you can't just use the strong form for, for this method is because it requires a, a solution to the second derivative, and that creates a limitation. And so basically, when you put it in the weak form, it, they also call that averaging, or um, it's called a few other things. But basically, the weak form is, is doesn't require, it doesn't have the same limitations. First of all, it only requires the first derivative, and so it just doesn't have as stringent um, requirements for solving it. So it's easier to solve using these methods. So that's why you want to put it in the weak form. And <clears throat> so to obtain the weak form, so this is step number two. First of all, you start with a strong form, which is step number one. And you probably already have that equation. And then you multiply the equation by a test function. And you so in this, I'm saying the test function is equal to this v. And then you integrate the whole equation over the domain. <clears throat> and then you integrate by parts. And you use the divergence theorem to do that. And so then you can see this equation that I have here is this one. So this is the weak form of this equation. So this is a weak form of the Poisson equation. And I've applied. Um, so the domain is 0 to 1. And <clears throat> so then I already kind of talked about how the weak form gives more flexibility, both mathematically and numerically. So that's why we want to have it in that form. And these steps um, where you go from, so it's pretty obvious that how to multiply the equation by a test function. Basically, you just multiply, you go back to this equation and multiply that by your test function. And then you to integrate over the whole domain, you just integrate. And <clears throat> to solve that integration, you want to integrate by parts. And I know that I'm not showing all the details of the math, but it, I didn't want to go into the gory details of the math for this presentation, because it takes time to go through it. And I don't really feel like that's the point. Like I feel like the point of this is to say, okay, you need to put your equation in the weak form for finite element analysis. And then if you need to go, and then if you're setting up your code or doing something to where you need to put your equation in the weak form, then you can go Google how to do that. And there's a lot of information and detailed steps on how to do that. So that's why I didn't go over that in detail here. So uh, because just knowing that you need to go from the strong form to the weak form is good enough for the overview. So then step number three, you choose approximations for the unknown functions. And so basically, we're going to assume that the solution takes the following form. So we're saying that 
u of x is equal to the sum of cj and then this phi j. And so this phi j is the basis function. And so I also want to point out that in Galerkin finite element method, which is what I'm using, it uses the same function for both the test and the basis function. So if you go back this test function v, I'm going to use the same I'm going, to, I'm going to use the same function here for this v as the test function as I'm using for this basis function in this solution. So for number four, so, so now you have the what your what your solution looks like, but you still don't know what the basis function is, and so you need to select you need to choose that, and so these. So, and the basis function, I already kind of touched on that, how it's kind of like the polynomial, uh, how you solve polynomials. So the basis function is basically a function that's multiplied by the coefficient and added to form the solution. So if you go back, the c's are the coefficients, and that's what we're solving for. And then the basis function will be known once you select it. So, and here, like here, same idea as x to the n, function and polynomial fitting and can so you can use and you can actually use this as your shape function this x to the n so it can be linear quadratic or cubic higher order basis functions can can sometimes achieve the same results with as low order with fewer elements and so when you think about solving your problem you're splitting it into you're splitting your domain into elements and that's why it's called finite element and so if you have a lot of elements you might get a good solution but it might also take a lot of time to run or it might take a lot of computing power so if you can use fewer elements and maybe a higher order basis function and get the same um, you might get a good result with less computing power there's a there's a lot of research that goes into figuring out computational schemes for like to to shorten your analysis or shorten computing time because some of these can take like days to run <laughs> depending on what you put in it and so likely you're not going to run into these sorts of problems unless you're actually writing FE code for like a company or something like that and then you might have to start thinking about this stuff, but just for this, it, it's usually you don't need to really worry too much. But there are some cases where you need to think about that if which basis function you're using. So, for instance, for the Poisson equation, I'm just going to use a hat basis function. This is linear. It's really simple, and I know it works to solve this problem. But if when I get to the solid mechanics problem, you actually need to use a quadratic basis function. And the reason why is because when you solve a solid mechanics problem, you're solving your equation of motion for the displacement, and then you and then you need to solve that to get the stress and strain. And if you if so if you just use say the hat basis function for that problem, you would get a good solution for the displacement, but then you wouldn't get a good solution for the stress and strain. So you need a higher order basis function for solid mechanics problems. And I don't know if there's a specific way that you can pick your basis functions depending on your problem. I know that like I've, I've looked into it a little bit to see if there's a set methods and I couldn't find anything specific it seems more to do with just kind of knowing that a certain basis function works with the problem you're solving. And so if, if you're solving a problem, I would just Google it because most of the, almost all of the uh, problems like these famous equations or various problems have been solved by FE. And so you can go look at what basis functions people are using and just use that if so I mean that that's how I've always done it I just kind of 
look at what other people are using to figure out which basis function to use. And I've only, so I've mainly been solving stuff like, well, this equation and then solid mechanics problems. And so I know that for solid mechanics, I need to use a quadratic or higher basis function. So that's kind of how you pick those. And so that's just something to keep in mind too. Like if you're using a, oh, and a lot of these programs um, that do finite element analysis for you, they, I don't remember, I haven't used very many of them, but I don't remember ever having to pick the basis function. So they might pick it for you based on the problem. But if, say you are running into a problem with like getting a bad solution or it's just not working, one thing that you could try is changing your basis functions. So that's why just kind of knowing what's going on in the program helps to troubleshoot if you're not getting a good solution. So then the last step is to solve it. And so we, we have our basis function. We know what the solution looks like. So we should be able to solve it. So what we do is we plug our assumed solution and the basis function into this weak form of the equation. And then when we do that, and then if you remember, I'm also using this V. I'm also I'm using the same basis function for my weighting function. So this is also the phi here in here. So then this can be put into matrix form. So this is this. So I have here where this A <clears throat> phi I phi J is equal to that. And then I and then this is the this function. So F phi is equal to this. And we can calculate this because we know what basis function we're using. And we should be able to calculate this. And so what we're looking for, the unknown that we're looking for are these C's or the coefficient. So in matrix form, this looks like this. And so this is really easy, easy to solve. Oh, actually, sorry. So I wanted to also mention that this A is called the stiffness matrix. And it's calculated based on the mesh and basis functions. So that's why we can calculate that. The right side is determined by discretizing the functions. So we just take this and we discretize it. And then we should be able to calculate this side too. So then we have a system of equations that can be solved in MATLAB. And so just as a quick, so I'm going to show you the MATLAB code in a minute, but just as a quick overview of what you do in MATLAB, first you generate your mesh, and then you calculate the stiffness matrix, or you program in directly if you calculated it by hand. And then you calculate your F vector, you apply your boundary conditions, and then you solve directly. And this solving directly is, some people say that that's bad form, but I think that for a problem like this where you're where you're not worried about computing power or anything like that. This it's fine to solve it directly. So, so this is the MATLAB code, and I'm not going to go through it in detail because the point of this is I just want to show you what I'm doing, not necessarily how I'm doing it. So first I define the mesh and I and I'm defining so for this equation, so this is what my like if I go back to this equation, this f of x, this this a and q that I'm defining, that's f of x. So you when you solve your problem, you'll have to know what f of x is, and you'll usually know what that is. It's some forcing function, or it might be zero, or something like that. So don't worry about that too much for this. And then the, and then I'm building my A matrix. So I'm, and I'm using a hat function. So I go through and do that. I build the F vector. And then, so then moving on. So then I apply the boundary conditions. So I have F and A. 
and I know what my boundary conditions are because they're given. And then this is the direct solve. So this is matrix division in MATLAB. So basically u is equal to a backslash f. And like I said, some people think this is bad form, but I think for a problem like this, this is fine. And a lot of people do it. So just if, if, if for whatever reason you, you're, this isn't going to work for you, you'll probably know already. So you'll, cause you're, so you'll apply, you'll solve this using a different method. So anyway, then I just plot everything. So, and these are the results I got. So the straight line is the analytical solution because for this problem, the analytical solution is, you can calculate the analytical solution. And I, I didn't show that in the slides, but um, basically I, I used, um, so going back to this equation, so I used the u double prime x is equal to f of x with these boundary conditions. And then the f of x was equal to a, I believe it was a over q. And a was 1 plus epsilon x, and q was pi squared sine pi x. But I didn't want to go into detail on that because I wanted to stay really general. And depending on what your equation is, I, this is probably different. And so I just wanted to use the really general form of the equation. And then, I mean, that could also be 0 if you have a Laplace plus equation. So anyway, that, so yeah, so I have the analytical solution, which is this straight line. And then these other solutions are the number of elements. So I solved it for 20, 40, 80, and 100 elements. So you can see for 20 elements, it's pretty good, but it's off the most. So it, the lower number of elements definitely came up with like the worst solution. And then as I increase the elements, you can see that the solution gets better and so depending on your computing power and what and how accurate you need your solution to be, you can kind of decide your number of elements. And then I didn't solve this with a, with a different basis function. Like I was using the hat basis functions. And so I don't know if I had used a quadratic basis function. This might have been even better. I'm not sure. So that's something else you can try too. If, you keep increasing your elements and you're not getting the solution you want, you can try changing your basis function. So now I want to talk about the solid mechanics problem. And so basically I have this cement composite. So I have cement on one side and then I have hydrostone. And the way I'm setting up this numerical problem, it's 1D and I have this right side fixed so it doesn't just push it. And then I have, and then I'm applying a pressure of 3000 PSI to the other side. I'm assuming that the initial stresses are zero, there's no body forces, and that loading is only in the elastic region. And the reason why I'm assuming that is so I can assume linear elasticity. And so for this load, and so I know that I can assume this because I've done the measurements in the lab for um, the loading, and I've seen that at 3,000 psi, this is still in the elastic region. So that's just something that you have to, um, based on what you're doing, like if I was applying 10,000 psi, then this wouldn't be a good assumption anymore because I wouldn't be in the elastic region. I might need to use more Coulomb or like some specific cement um, constitutive relationship. So, and then for the governing equations, I have the equation of motion, and this rho bj is the body force, this sigma, or yeah, sigma is stress, and then this rho aj, so this is, this aj is the um, second derivative of displacement with respect to time, and it's written like this just to be general. So, the rho is the bulk density. And then I also need, so this is the equation I'm actually solving in the finite element 
analysis. And then in order to get the strain, I need to solve this equation. And then I can use a constitutive relationship to get the stress from the strain. And so anyway, that so these these are the equations that you need to solve this solid mechanics problem. And these U's are the displacement and this C I J K L is it what that is equal to depends on what you're assuming. So in this case I'm assuming linear elasticity and so then stress and then this epsilon is strain. So the first thing I want to do, and I'm I'm not so I would so going back real quick, you use the exact same method on these equations as you did for this Poisson equation. I'm not going to go through the whole thing in detail again because what I want to show is the broad overview and so and the solid mechanics one is a little more involved deriving these so but this is available pretty it, it, these derivations are all online so if you need them then you can go look that up so going back to this so I just jumped straight from the governing equations so these would be the strong form of the equations to where I discretize them. So I have the system of equations and this is sort this is the same form as before. So I, I'll end up with uh, A, so the stiffness matrix multiplied by this displacement is equal to the force the force vector. And so a is the, so the stiffness matrix in this case, it's a function of properties of the solid, so that's this constitutive relationship. The geometry interpolation functions and nodal positions. And so these phi's are the basis functions again, if you remember. And then well, the, the basis function and the weighting, uh, I guess weighting function. And, but since I'm using Galark and FAM, I'm assuming they're the same thing. And so then I have the force vector, and this is a function of boundary loading, interpolation functions, and nodal positions. So this BI by A, these are body forces. So for mine, this will be zero, but I just left this in because I programmed it into the, into the program. So if I have a body force later on, I can just easily add it. And then this is traction or tension, so this so this would be applied based on what your load is or whatever else you have. And so with these equations, this they're both of these are fully defined. Like we can calculate these. And so we should be able to solve the system of equations for displacement. And so then for the basis function, because going back. I mean, they are fully defined, but I still haven't shown, uh, we still haven't selected the basis function, so we need to do that. So here's this um, cement composite again, and this is just generic. I actually have more elements than this, but I just wanted to demonstrate what the elements look like. So I have element one, two, and three, and then one thing to keep in mind is you if you have two types of materials, you always want to have your element defined on the junction between the two materials. You don't want to have, a, say, an element here that crosses over. Like, you don't want an element with both. It, I think that would just add a lot of complication. And so, like I said before, I'm using a quadratic basis function because the... So, I could use the hat function here again, but and that would calculate a good displacement, but it wouldn't be good for the stress calculation. So for that, I need a quadratic basis function. And so the quadratic basis function has three nodes on each element, and then um, oh, and then yeah. So and then uh, so this is the definition of it. So I have minus one to zeta to one, and I don't know why I have zero to one here, but. <clears throat> This is showing the 
what the quadratic basis functions look like. So this is 1, 2, and 3. And these are the equations for those. And then also, I already mentioned that the two elements meet at the interface, so no elements cross this interface. So then the, the MATLAB algorithm is similar to the last one, and I'm not going to show you the code this time because it's really long, but basically you calculate the stiffness matrix and the force vector. You add pressure to the force vector because in this case I'm applying a load to one side, so depending on what you have, you might not do that, or you might have a body force or something else. So, And then I modify the stiffness matrix to account for the boundary conditions, and then I solve for displacement using that um, the MATLAB <laughs> yeah, using the MATLAB matrix division. I calculate the strain from the displacement, and then I calculate stress from the constitutive relationship. And so this is the mesh that I came up with in MATLAB. And I, I'm comparing this, so when I did this, I compared it to the same model in Itasca. And Itasca is a, it uses finite difference, I believe. And so this Itasca model is actually 2D. And so what I did to make it similar to the MATLAB one, which is 1D, is I fixed the top and bottom in the y direction so it can't so it can only move in the x direction and I also fix this end in this right side in both x and y directions and then I'm applying the 3000 psi to this side and then the same thing in MATLAB I have this side fixed and I'm applying the 3000 psi to this side and so then as far as the elements I have so the elements in the cement are smaller than the elements in the rock. And the reason why is because if I made all of the elements, say, this small size through the rock, it would take a long time to calculate because I would have a lot of elements. And I don't really need that many elements in the cement because it's big. It's really big compared to the cement. And this is something you'll run into when you're running these models is you'll have say you'll have if you have something that's really small and something that's really large you can run into problems with the small part not coming out very well in the simulation and so then you have to do stuff like this and so and then the other and I guess the issue is if I made all, all of these elements in the cement or all the elements in the cement the same size as the elements in the rock, I have this big element, then I would only have one element to account for all of the cement, and so that wouldn't give a very good solution for what's going on in the cement. So that's why I did that. And they actually call this refinement. So anyway. So I, for the parameters, and so I actually used a more Coulomb model in some cases, but for this I just used, for what I'm going to show you, it's just a linear elastic model, so that just used the shear modulus and the Poisson ratio, so the shear modulus for the cement was 6.044 10 to the 4 and 6.237 10 to the 5th in the rock or the hydrostone, and then the Poisson ratio was 0.2 and 0.29. So then the, these are the results, so this is the displacement it, so the displacement in the Itasca model ranged from 0.005 to 0.025 inches, and in the MATLAB model it ranged from 0.001 to 0.007 inches. So basically the Itasca model predicted a larger displacement, but they both predicted a higher displacement in the cement than in the rock, which is what I was expecting. And then this is showing the um, I mean, the stress is just what I applied. And then the strain was MATLAB calculated 0.0092 to 0.0008, and Itasca calculated 0.012 to 0.004. And so this is, this is expected because I'm showing more displacement in Itasca than MATLAB, so I should have a higher strain. 
And then as far as measured, I don't think that this is actually correct because I was the load the load frame I was using, I don't think it's capable of coming I don't think it's capable of measuring displacements this small. I should have used a smaller load frame. So I don't think this is right, but assuming this was right, another reason for the difference could be that I used the parameters I used in the models weren't actually what I had in the cement and rocks. So that could be the other thing. So now I want to talk about MOOSE. So MOOSE stands for Multiphysics Object-Oriented Simulation Environment. And basically it's a framework that allows for rapid development of new, new tools and applications. It's, object, it's an object-oriented pluggable system and it's open source so anybody can go use it. And so it has the physics, it has, has thermal, solid mechanics, fluids, and reaction diffusion. It uses libmesh to, um, for the mesh finite element method and input output and then it has the solvers interface. And so the nice thing about Moose is it, so it has the framework and then you can, and then it has modules for the different physics. So you can go, you can either use the module or you can write an application for it and use the application to solve your problems. And so it has, it just has a lot of flexibility for what you can do. And so these are Moose applications that exist at INL. And I don't believe you can use most of these unless you're actually there, but this is just an example of what's been done in it. So they have bison, which has thermal mechanics, chemical and diffusion, pronghorn, which is neutronics and porous flow, marmot, fourth order phase, phase field. And so you get the point, like they have all these applications that can apply this, that can solve different types of problems. And so when you use Moose, you can write your own application, or if you're solving some simple problems, you can just use the physics module that you need. So for instance, say you just wanted, say you're just solving a solid mechanics problem, you could just go use the solid mechanics or tensor mechanics module, which is kind of what I've done. And so this is the model I'm going to be solving in Moose. And so this is a representation of, so this is a, 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 a lab scale um, well bore. So basically I have this inner, I have an inner pipe that I'm calling pseudo casing. I have a layer of oil well cement. I have a layer of hydrostone that's simulating rock. And then I have another layer of pipe basically to hold everything together. And these are, so, and these, the materials I'm using, the, the inner and outer pipes are aluminum. And the reason why I'm using that is so I can CT it. And so basically I wanted to simulate this in Moose and see what all these different layers are doing when I apply a stress to this inner pipe or load. And so this is the, what you would use for your Moose input file. So when you use Moose, you either write, so you can either write this or they do have a graphical interface that will write this for you depending on what you select on the interface. So it's pretty straightforward once you get it up and going. So I'm, and in, so first thing you have a mesh and the, you can use, you can either, for a really simple mesh, you can make it directly in Moose, but actually it was called, their graphical interface is called Peacock and you can make your mesh in Peacock or you can make your mesh in Qubit or some other mesh generator and <clears throat> and then import it in. So this is, I'm just telling it where it is because I made this in Qubit because I don't think you could make a mesh this complicated in, in Moose. So anyway, the other thing is when you generate your mesh, you specify numbers for each of these volumes and each of your sides. So this inner, I have a number associated with this 
with the inside of this on the wall, and then I have numbers associated with each volume, etc. So then I tell it what variables I'm using, and so I'm only using x and y because I'm actually solving this as axisymmetric. So you'll see in a minute that I define um, x as r and y as z. And then the, the blocks, so I have four blocks, one so block for the aluminum, cement, hydrostone, and then for the aluminum. So I'm saying that this applies to all the blocks. And then I'm calculating radial and hoop stress, so I need to define those. And you can also calculate strain with this. And then I have, for the boundary conditions, I have some various boundary conditions set up, but the only one I'm looking at is this interior pressure x. So basically I'm applying a pressure to the inside of this tube. And so you can specify what's active. And so I'm applying minus 2.07 e to the seventh pascals to this, to the inside of that pipe. And it's negative because it's compressive. And then for materials, I have a shale, aluminum, and cement. And you can set up your materials. So I'm saying that so this is a cement, I'm saying it's elastic. Displacement Z is equal to Y, and displacement R is equal to X because it's axisymmetric. The, and then I just put in my parameters. And so I do that for each material. And I had this set up with steel because I was originally looking at it with steel, but we need to see through it, so that's why we switched to aluminum. But you can see that the only active ones I have are shale, aluminum, and cement. And then you can also tell it what block this applies to. So I have the cement is block six, the aluminum is block five and eight, and the shale is block seven. So then I'm saying, okay, it's an FE problem. It's axisymmetric, symmetric, so the coordinate type is RZ. I'm defining the executioner, and <clears throat> So, and the outputs, and a lot of this, if you use Peacock, it just puts a lot of this in for you, so you don't need to worry about it. I'm using the solid mechanics module, so I specify that. The other, um, they have another module called tensor mechanics that also does solid mechanics, and the last I heard, they were trying to get people to use that instead of solid mechanics. So, you can look at that if you decide you wanna use this program. So these are the results. So the displacement it calculated somewhere between 8.06 e to the minus fifth to 6.59 e to the minus sixth. This is in meters, and I haven't calculated what that is in inches. And then so this is the radial stress, and so it's calculating between 1.82 10 to the seventh to 1.98. 10 to the fifth, and then the hoop stress. And so anyway, th this is just to show you kind of what the capability is in this program and the what you can do with it and the types of problems you can solve. So going back to the end, I hope that this was helpful in just providing a broad overview for finite element analysis, and like I said, if you are using a solver, you're probably just going to put in what you, you're probably just going to put in your boundary conditions and maybe create a mesh, and that's about it, but I just feel like it's helpful to kind of understand what's going on so that if you run into a problem, you can troubleshoot it or figure out what might have gone wrong. And then if you actually have to write your FE code, I think that having the broad overview is helpful because you can just say, okay, now I need to do this step, and now I need to do this step. And so then you can just go search for examples of those specific things and kind of work through it.